I'm Mr. Shachawat Wuti Silisad. I'm going to present a topic today about the sufficiency economy in a researcher life. So, first, I would like to briefly introduce about myself. I'm Shachawat Wuti Silisad, and the people around here call me Shin as a nickname. And I graduated the secondary school from Piliyalai School, Playa Province in the north of Thailand. And then I got a really good opportunity to study in Mahidon Vithya Nusan School, where we are here. And then I got degree um, in engineering, both master and bachelor degree in um, mechanical engineering from Chulalongkorn University. And I took my first job as an energy researcher in Iron and Steel Institute of Thailand. Then I moved to Banpu Public Company as a commissioning engineer and researcher. Now today, I'm a business analyst and developer for Banpu Infinity, the subsidiary company of Banpu Public Company. Well, when I talk about sufficiency economy in my life, I would have to draw back to 1997. It was the year that what we um, bump up with the financial crisis. At that time, the sufficiency economy got presented intensively. And at that time, I was 10. All the pictures that the media illustrated to me and made me understand about the sufficiency economy is to be a farmer. So about sufficiency economy, at that time, 10 years old boy, think about we have to be the farmer, stay in the paddy field. But my family run the small business in the north of Thailand. We run the business and how the media illustrate the people who run the business as a capitalist who in the capitalism which look a little bit negative from the picture that you see on the screen here. So it's really confused for the 10 years old boy that shall we leave our business and move to the farmhouse or not? This is a problem that I always keep in mind. Until one day I was in Mahidon with Yanusan and there was a poster that showing the topic about sufficiency economic versus capitalism conducted by Ajahn Chon Bunak from Faculty of Economics, Thammasat University, who is the son of Ajahn Wachilawan Bunak, who is our teacher at that moment in Mahidon Vithyanusan. The lecture it was really successful, full of the attendance in the hall. But the thing that I got on that day from Ajahn Chon has quite disappointed me because it's not an action movie that sufficiency economy is going to find together with um, capitalism. At first, I thought there is one who's going to defeat. But what he told to us is it cannot, it cannot fight to each author because sufficiency economy is not economic system, but it is philosophy. I know that thing since that day. But to be honest, on that day, I have no understanding. From that day, the time fly. It's about the time that I, I was uh, work as a researcher in the Iron and Steel Institute. I'm about to go for my PhD on the topic about the biomass to liquid. And this news got known by Banpu Public Company, where I got an extra job as an advisor for the company. They, they know that I'm going to do this topic for my PhD, so they persuaded me to join the project that's um, similar to the topic that I have interest. They call the project Code to Liquid Project. And Code to Liquid Project of Banpu Public Company Here's the location. This is the picture of great land 
of Gobi Desert, Mongolia. Underneath this land is abundance of coal resources, and Banpu Public Company would like to make value added of their res uh, coal reserve in here. So they create the project. That is how the research on desert begin. Well, as a researcher, I start to analyze what can we do on the desert. We found pyrolysis is the key because it is the coal conversion process which requires no water. Okay, I will give you more details about pyrolysis process. What you can see on the screen here is not a branch of bacteria. It is the molecular structure of solid fuels, liquid fuels, and gas fuel. You can see the most complex one. It is the solid fuels. If the complexity reduces, it becomes the liquid fuels. And the simplest molecule that you see on there is, is the molecular structure of gas fuels. So how does the pyrolysis work? Pyrolysis is how you heat the solid fuel in the absence of oxygen atmosphere. This is really important because it has to be absent of oxygen. If there is some oxygen exists, it's going to be a combustion. So once it's got heated, the molecule is going to break down into the smaller one. The big molecule that still remains in the industrial term, we call it char. And the medium-sized molecule that break out from the big one has become the liquid fuel, or we call it tar. And the smallest uh, molecule that's spreading around here stands for gas. And if you see it carefully, there is one family of molecular um, um, structure that you may know, which is H2O under here. So this process also delivers water. These are four major products of pyrolysis process. Then we go through the research around the world from the past to present day. And now we found Professor Hu Haoxuan. He is a professor from Dalian University of Technology, who is a researcher still active in the field of coal conversion. And, and he majorly do coal pyrolysis. We approached his laboratory and found the magnificent research facility in his lab. So Banpu Public Company and Dalian University of Technology established the cooperation to conduct the research about coal pyrolysis in there. I, I was there and worked with a billion student on the picture here, these are the graduate uh, Chinese students who work extremely hard all day or night to identify how, uh, how can we convert our coal resources into tar oil. And we found that in our um, coal mine, the tar yield that we can gain is around 5 to 15%. 5 to 15% is quite wide range of the yield that we can gain because it depends on the condition that we apply to the coal. We did a research sophisticatedly. We go down to see the optim optimized point. How can we set the condition to gain the maximized tar yield? Moreover, we still can set the process to get the specific process, uh, uh, to, to get the specific products from the process. However, when we enjoy researching in Dalian, the stock market does not feel the same. They're trying us to make something that bigger, real, and close to the op uh, real operation. So, they pushed the company to establish the pilot plant in South Gobi, 
Mongolia, while the res our research team haven't finished conducting the research. And the outcome of designing plant without the, the scientific research support. It turned out um, really disappoint outcome. On the 2015, the pilot plant that was built, it still cannot deliver um, enough tar oil to, to the company. And the budget was run out from the initial budget from uh, two million US dollar to 67,000 US dollar. And another coincidence at that moment is, if you remember in the second half of year 2014, the oil, uh, the oil price dropped down rapidly. And that make the stock market loss and interest on the project anymore. But that is the time that capitalism attacked to my life. Because all the money that we invest into the project, it has to be worth spending. Everyone wants the plan that already spent to be work. So they assigned to me to go to South Gobi, Mongolia, and conduct the research, conduct um, the operation, raise up the plant, and make it run. I would like to confess at this stage, on the first day that I got assignment, it was absolutely dark. And it was so cold in the mid of winter in Mongolia. Because this plan, it was not designed by our team, so we don't know exactly how it, it works, how the equipment, how it designed. Everything in the plant, we have no ideas. We just have a knowledge about coal pyrolysis in the lab. But now we have to do, do the big scale. And what the company gave to me are these lovely four workers. Actually, there's another one who holding the camera shot to us. So including me is five people. And only me that holding an engineering degree. So four of them. They are good people, but has no any engineering or, scientific, or, or science degree. I, myself, at that time, I felt like I got abundant in the far corner of the world without budget adding from the company and also skillful workforce. It was really hard time and desperate. I have to rethink, how can we solve, how can I accomplish these tasks? What the thing that I would like to be, uh, start with is the team. I think about now today, there is no um, any skillful engineers or researchers like I work in institu uh, Iron and Institute of Thailand, or the billion graduate students in China anymore. They are the local people and have no degree. So I have to build them as a team by converting. Before, I always um, communicate in our, uh, our, among, in our team in the scientific language, but I have to convert it into the common language that everyone can understand what, what, what we are doing right now. So these are the problem statements that I spread out to everybody, not limited to our team, everybody in the mind side. It's just a simple and common language. I just told that now our reactor got clogging and they have some gas leaking and our char that um, delivered is unqualified, it's uncooked. And there also some waste water that produced out from, from the plant. Once the message goes through everyone in the my side, it makes everyone understand what we are doing right there. Now we are starting the study. I went into the reactor, captured thousands of pictures, collect hundreds of samples, name them, and map them up, how, how, how they, um, where's their position 
and in the reactor. And we bring all the equipment out to test each piece by each piece to make me uh, to make more understand about all the equipment in the plant. Then we gather, gather, gather in and out reactor, in and out reactor. And then at the end of every day, we share all of this document. What the new information that we gain on that day, we will post it on the wall of our office so everyone can approach to the same information. Even the housekeeper, the housekeeper come through and see some um, interesting pictures and they will ask our team, what is this about? And our team can express them and um, tell them in the simple language. So then is the moment that the housekeeper, even the housekeeper can give us an idea. So now I don't have only one researcher anymore. Everyone are mine researcher. And we're working as a peer, no superior. We are the same team. We are on the same level. Everyone approach the same information. And everyone are welcome to discuss everything in details. Until one day, all the information that we can gather, we can mock up and simulate. Of course, we have no budget. We simulate it through the open source software. Then we found out inside the reactor, in the orange areas, is, is the or area that the um, reaction exists. The gas and oil came out from the, the orange areas. And it's stagnant inside because some part of um, tar oil condensed in the top layers of the bed. It's blocked the gas to penetrate the coal bed out. That is why it's caused clocking inside the reactor. So we deliver the message that gas stagnant inside the, the bed to everyone in the mine site. And here is a return. There is one staff of our mine. They come to me and then told, if there is some gas stagnant inside the reactor, why don't we wind it out by snorkel? From this idea is, is the initiative, um, in, is, is the original idea to initiate the equipment we call wind pipe. Wind pipe is just a simple pipe that holds it a lot in one end. But it's really difficult to hold a lot, to drill a lot of hole on the one end of the pipe because in our mine site in South Gobi Desert, we have only hand drill, so we have to drill one by one. But that, that it, never mind, I can guarantee by my engineering degree, I make the, um, just a simple stand ball machine from the hand drill. This can fasten our process. Later that is out of time and limited budget. We cannot operate the big reactor every time that we would like to test every uh, equipment or test our hypothesis. So I built up the small reactor from the drums. When we build up the small reactor from the drums, there's there no facility to handle the gas, to collect the gas, or to count how much the gas that produced from, from the process. That's also never mind, because we can use the um, water replacement method to collect the gas and tar vapor from the process. And here it is. And how can we solve and can we identify the pressure inside the coal bed? Because if the gas already went out or released out from the bed, there's no any stagnant gas inside the coal bed. The pressure should release down. We have no pressure gauge in the middle of nowhere. Never mind, we can use the water level manometer. We initiate and invent a lot of tunes for the project. And oops, this is my picture when chanting mantra and when conduct the, the, the experiment. 
And this is the result. You can see the blue bar, it was the pressure inside the coal bed before we install the wind pipe. And the, the red bar is after we install. We can see the pressure drop down dramatically. So it means the gas is not stagnant inside the coal bed anymore. But as a consequence, since the gas is not inside the coal bed anymore, it overflow and it flow out too fast for the human to control it manually. That is also never mind. I can bring it back. My, my skill that I learned it in Thailand, both in Chulalongkorn University and Mahidol Vihanusan here, which is electronics, microcontroller, and programming to make the automatic gas pressure control in a budget of 100 bucks. And this is also an, an, another interesting thing because in the pro pyrolysis process, we want to heat it homogeneously. And this is the heating patterns. We try to upgrade heating patterns. You can see the progress before um, the, the, the cold bed is what, uh, the uh, temperature distribution is so fluctuate. You can see from the, the, the chart below there. And when we upgrade, the fluctuation of temperature distribution scope down in the smaller range, but the base arrangement of heating, it initiate from this man who has a helmet and mustard. He's a big fan of Freddie Mercury. He's just an operator who has no any degree, but he operates there every day and initiate the method how to make the coal inside the reactor homogeneous. Another problem that I would like to state, it is the last product that I, I told to you. It is the water. And the water from the process is not really clear and nice and what, uh, what you see on the screen here. Indeed, this is the real waste water from the plant. It color, it is the same as full body red wine. And I sent this sample to all the lab in the Mongolia and they refuse to taste it because I cannot tell them what it is, exactly not red wine, but what it is. They all refuse me because they're afraid that my sample gonna ruin their machine. I was in a really dark moment because I didn't use much chemistry since I graduated from Mahidon Vitya Nusson. But it was one click that in my head was flashback in the exam, the laboratory exam in Mahidon Vitya Nusson that the teacher gave us one solution and we have to identify it before the ring, uh, the bells got ring. We have to identify it in two or three minutes. So I just flash back to, to, to that uh, circumstances. And then this chart come out in my mind. It is how we classify the matters. So I use the old knowledge from Mahidon Witi Anuthan. I firstly make the sand filter and then I bring vinegar for the acid extraction. And I crush the limestone and mix with water to make limestone water as a base solution to do the base extraction. And the last picture that you see on the right hand is a fake chemist who do the titration wrongly. The face is so serious. Well, and then one day, it was one day, I went in through the storage and found out this bottle. I, I asked my peers what it is. He told me it's a bacteria. And that time, I losing my engineering degree, and now I would like to be the microbiologist. I'm going to treat the wastewater by the bacteria. So I taste it, I heat it, heat it in the hot part and taste it is 
aerobic or anaerobic bacteria. These are all the, the knowledge that we have lost for so long, and I just bring it up in the Gobi Desert again. And once I know it's an aerobic bacteria, I watch on YouTube and fabricate the aerator. No use any electricity or no spend any money, just build it from the scrap. And there are many inventions that I made on the Gobi Desert, all are made from the scraps. After one year of struggling, I light up the plant again. And this time, the plant can run smoothly for weeks. No cold clogging anymore. And no oil and gas leak from the plant anymore. And all the wastewater have the way to be treated. And on the left-hand side is the pictures of our operator. Before we use it for, but now it's only one who stay in front of the monitor. And at the bottom line, how much that we spent for this project is just about only 10% of the budget that they left at the beginning. So what the thing that I learned from Gobi Desert, Mongolia, I would place the valuable knowledge that I gained from there. It is not pyrolysis technique. It is not um, the skill to work in um, varieties of peoples. It is not the skill to work under the harsh environment of Mongolia. But the most valuable thing that I learned from Gobi Desert is the philosophy. It's make me understanding the sufficiency economy is not in the paddy field. It's not on Gobi Desert. It's not in capitalism. It's not in socialism. Sufficiency economy always in insufficient circumstances. To all young peers in here, you have a long way to go on the research, to go on inventing. I would like to all the young peers in here to know Do not give any excuse if you not do something. Don't say, we don't have enough resources to do this or that. But please fulfill your head by the knowledge. Fulfill your heart by the passion. And take the sufficiency economy as your soul. On that day, you will fully understand insufficiency invents innovation. Thank you, everyone, for your attention.